So, welcome to the next panel um, from the Elevate Festival. Today, um, we have a very important um, topic to talk about. It's about regulation and free speech in the digital area. So, the name of the panel is called More Than a Word, Free Digital Speech and Regulation. Um, we want to discuss how digital technologies affect democracy and freedom of expression. Um, with questions in mind, can freedom of expression be balanced with digital regulation at all? How does the use of social media influence political processes? And how can democracies protect themselves from digital manipulation? So these are just a few thoughts that we have in mind today. Um, I'll briefly introduce um, the panel. And then each of them will give a five to ten minute um, very short sum up of the key positions on this um, controversial theme, because I think this is better that we know um, what are the, the positions of each one of them. And then we go into discussion, and also in the end we have planned to have 20 to 30 minutes question and answers with you. My name is Julia Hamburg, I'm a journalist from the nonprofit uh, newsroom Dossier, and I'm also working with Reporters Without Borders, and it's my pleasure to moderate this panel today. Um, I'll start to my right, uh, Silke Grunwald, she came from Switzerland, she's a journalist and initiator of Lobby Watch in Switzerland. She investigates power and technology from a feminist perspective. And then uh, Ms. Eliska Birkova, she's a human rights lawyer and a policy advisor for the Digital Service Act, focusing on freedom of expression and protection of digital rights. And Mr. Michael Bosetta, a researcher um, from the University of Lund, um, specialized in the interplay between social media and politics. He hosts also the Social Media and Politics podcast. Welcome. So I hand over the stage, um, starting with you, with your key positions. Yes. So first of all, thank you uh, to all of you coming out. And can we kick on? I have a few slides here coming from uh, the academic world, of course. And I thought, um, you know, uh, what, what can I bring to this festival coming from uh, academia? And so I thought theory, a little bit of theory I think you should have. So next slide, please. And the one I thought I'd talk about is speech act theory. And what speech act theory says is that words are actions. Words have force, and they can change things in the world. And I think a common example of this, or a basic example, is if you've ever had um, a, someone break up with you, and it, whatever the words that are said, whether it's uh, we're done, or it's not you, it's me, right? These words have force, they end the relationship, and they make one feel bad. It's not the words themselves, it's the action that these words carry with them. That's speech act theory. Sorry, can we go back one? Thank you. So if, if we're thinking about speech act theory, there's sort of a problem in research, but also I think in how we think about uh, speech when it comes to political speech, that we think about political speech as opinions. So saying your position about politics with words. And this is not really how a lot of political speech happens. Political speech is more than words. And sometimes no words are involved at all. I think um, this example from the Chinese protests around COVID is a great example, where holding up a piece of paper without words is a form of political speech. So political speech is more than words. And to go even further, to the next slide, please. Digital actions, things like likes, retweets, reporting something on a platform doesn't involve words, yet it's a form of speech, and it's also a form of political action when you like a politician's post, when you're retweeting news articles. It's not words, but it's a form of action. And so if we go to the next slide and take this sort of thought all the way to the extreme, even just being present in an online space can be a form of political action. So things like Zoom bombing, when you infiltrate a Zoom room, or they have this thing called Twitch rating, where Trolls will go into, let's say, a trans person's Twitch stream and blow up the comment feeds with stuff like this, which is not words. These are digital actions showing presence in a digital space, and these are a form of political action and political speech. So that's just a bit of abstract <laughs> theory to think about how complex what we're talking about political speech is. 
So if we move to the next slide, I thought to move out of theory and a little bit more into the real world with three sort of challenges for regulation, three things to think about. And it'll, it'll be a, a bit provocative in that I'm trying to present a little bit what the complexity is when it comes to actually um, thinking about regulation. And I've broken those down into possibility, responsibility, and resources. So let's take possibility first. This graph shows the amount of content generated across these four platforms in one minute, and the difference between 2013 and 2022. So just to give you an example, there's 1.7 million pieces of content generated on Facebook per minute. So if we take this hour and a half talk, and if we tried to look at all the content that was produced on Facebook during it, you could scroll without sleeping until you die and never see it. There's so much data that needs to be filtered into the size of a device this big. And we as humans just cannot process all of this data. So algorithms filter this content in order to provide it to us in a way that we can understand. And by doing so, they have to make decisions. What gets visible and what gets invisible. And so when you think about regulation coming in and saying, how should these algorithms work? The question is, is this actually technologically possible to have free speech where everyone can be heard? Because you have to prioritize some things and not others, just because there's so much data to be put on one device. So the idea that there is a free speech platform is technologically impossible. Next slide, please. So the second question is, we often think about platforms having a responsibility to democracy. And I'm not sure where that responsibility comes from. Um, here are a number of large companies, and we don't technically think of, or we don't usually think of McDonald's or Coca-Cola or Walt Disney having a responsibility to democracy, right? And so I'm just kind of, I know it's provocative, but where does that question come from? A company like Samsung, which we've all heard from or heard about, is also in the information technology space, but we don't think about Samsung having a responsibility to a clean information environment, right? But we put this responsibility on companies like Meta and Google, and I just wonder where that comes from. Because if we go to the next slide, companies also have freedom of speech. We can think about companies that make moral statements or the way that they conduct their business can be a political, a form of political speech. Companies pulling out of Russia, right, is a form of political speech. And so if we start to think about how should we regulate platforms and tell them to, you know, have this content and not that content, we're starting to interfere with their rights uh, for freedom of speech. Think about a news organization. A news organization is not required to publish your views. You can write an opinion piece, but the platform doesn't have to publish it. Same thing with Twitter, right? They don't have to publish your tweet, and they can decide which ones they accept and which ones they don't. That's their right as a company uh, to have freedom of speech, and that's enshrined in many countries into law. Next slide, please. This is the last one, and this is the argument about resources. Moderation needs resources. So this uh, top graph is part of a European Commission exercise that takes local experts in each country, and they report hate speech when they see it on the platform. And the platform is notified. And what this chart shows is within 24 hours, how good are platforms at responding to this flag that there is hate speech on their platform. And they've done this over the past six years. And so if you look all the way on the left, I know it's a little bit hard to see, is that in the beginning, the companies that are most responsive to answering hate speech are companies with the largest resources, companies like Tw uh, YouTube and Facebook, whereas Twitter is the worst. Over time, these companies have gotten better in addressing uh, flags of hate speech, except for the past six months when they've gotten worse. And what the bottom graph shows is Meta's stock price, which has also dropped more than 50% in the same time period. And so I don't know if there's a direct correlation between being less responsive to hate speech and having less resources as shown in their stock price, but it seems like that. And so my last slide here um, basically brings up the point that you need you need to have resources in order to pay people to develop systems and to monitor 
content that could be considered objectionable. And if we move to the last slide, there's sort of a um, potential cycle where is if regulation is designed in a way that ruins these platforms' business models or hurts their ability to make money, they'll have less resources. Less resources is less ability to respond to things like hate speech and harassment and may actually work to have more hate speech and harassment on the platforms because they don't have the money and resources in order to do it, which makes the problem a little bit more complex than just regulate these platforms. There may be a backfire effect where by regulating these platforms, you hurt their ability to make money, and then you also hurt their ability to respond to things like hate speech and harassment. So I know that's coming a bit from a different perspective from, from the last talk, and it's not necessarily one that I'm truly tied to, but I wanted to put it out there for discussion, and so my last slide here is uh, let's discuss it. Thank you. So I may invite now uh, Ms. Grunwald, as she's kind of in the middle with her positions, maybe between the two of you, to lay out your ideas. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you very much, uh, first of all, for having me, uh, for Julia and also Irina for inviting me on stage. I might elaborate on that key word you mentioned, hate speech, particularly in the field of um, my industry, which is journalism. Um, you mentioned it already, I try to work on the intersection of power and technology. I'll try to do so at best from a feminist perspective. In the last couple of years in the context of national security. Um, next five or so minutes, I uh, try to bridge the gap between my rather technical investigations and this afternoon's discourse of freedom of expression and opinion. First and foremost, a uh, disclaimer, or I, I read me the text, so to speak. Um, I always try to get to, as the reporter Kyle Bernstein put once, the best obtainable version of the truth. I had attempt to approach the truth. Some might argue I succeed, some might argue I fail. Neutrality or objectivity are duties we are charged with as reporters, sometimes there's a downright perversion of the idea of neutrality or object objectivity, as Caroline, Caroline Emke, a German philosopher, calls it. And that prevents, or might prevent things from being called by their names. As if every fact had to be dissolved and questioned by controversial ways of looking at things. I, as a person, am neither neutral nor objective. I carry a backpack full of Herkunftsgepäck. Of course, I adhere to international and national laws, our universal human rights, and I strongly believe that those normative guidelines are strongly needed, maybe more than ever. Yet, when it comes to working with my sources as a reporter, it always terrifies me how, especially, but not limited to, justice systems depend on something as erratic as memory and how different people might look at the same piece of information only to arrive at completely different conclusions. Um, I would like to quote Salih Tripathi, who chairs the Writers in Prison Committee at Penn International, who once said, if you, don't look, if you don't like something, you answer back with an argument. Counter words with words, books with books, viewpoints with critiques, assertions with facts. Face with reason and face with doubt. And in that context, I am, as a reporter, required to work precisely, conduct my investigations critically, and differentiate in writing, whether for print, digital, or podcasts. My last rather large investigation I did with a group of other reporters focusing on hacking groups for a podcast of the German public broadcaster titled Legion Hacking Anonymous. We saw the mask already. And for that podcast, I worked on the ground in Switzerland, Germany, Poland, and Ukraine, investigating state actors, as well as interviewing hacktivists with regards to their motivation and understanding of civil disobedience in times of war. And in times of war, truth and lies, heroism, terror, propaganda, and disinformation lie close together. Another investigation I did with another different team of reporters was around the elections of the German Bundestag. 
Again, we investigated a threat actor, Ghostwriter, aka Ankh um, 1151. Presumably, Ghostwriter had new sites to distribute false information. For example, the German soldiers had desecrated a Jewish cemetery in a Lithuanian city. Or that a Lithuanian child had been run over by a NATO tank. Not true, simply false. Ghostwriter had sent phishing emails to German politicians to gain access to their accounts, emails, platforms. This group troubles investigators and cybersecurity research intelligence agencies alike because what Ghostwriter does, it mixes both. Cyber, meaning hacking, and PSYOP, meaning influence components, or commonly summarized as disinformation and fake news. So, what to do? We learned from history, um, authoritarian regimes restrict the freedom of expression and opinion. The latest example is Georgia. There, the draft law on agents of foreign influence led to an outcry, a call for solidarity with civil society and independent media. The news that made the headlines this morning is that a Belarusian, Belarusian Nobel Prize laureate is sentenced to 10 years in prison. One of the patterns of regimes and violence is clearly to deny certain individuals and groups their humanity, and thus violence escalates. There is Gori Lankish, who was murdered, an um, Indian journalist who investigated fake news and disinformation. Daphne Guarwana Galizia was murdered because she investigated corrupt business practices on Malta. And there was Anna Politovskaya, she was murdered covering Russia's war in Chechnya. And there are my female LGBTQI plus colleagues around the globe experiencing racist slurs and insults, slander, systematic attigation, violence online and offline nearly, but not exclusively on, a, um, on an everyday basis. There are callings for our slaughtering, torture and rape. But we have to learn, we have learned to speak up, we have learned to protect us from surveillance, we have learned to defend ourselves legally. We echo the violence. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, Ms. Pirkova, you as a policymaker, you are now invited to lay out your positions. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, maybe I can just briefly introduce what Access Now is and what we do. We are a global human rights organization that defends human rights of users at risk around the world which in practice also allow us to monitor and map the state of human rights and digital ecosystem in different world regions. And I would like to maybe quickly take a step back and think about for a moment what we mean by free speech in online ecosystem. Um, because in online ecosystem, it doesn't only mean that my freedom of speech is being restricted in legitimate manner, either based on international human rights law, where we have exact conditions how free speech, which is not an absolute human right, can be restricted, but it's also interconnected to having a choice and proper understanding of a user how and I or how my information that I share in online ecosystem travel around, and why do I receive certain information. It means to exist in online ecosystem without discrimination and discriminatory bias that actually exists in those algorithmic content moderation and content curation mechanisms. It also means to stay safe and not to be silenced by online hatred or being subject to incitement to violence. And also it means to have a right to stay anonymous and have a right to end-to-end -end encrypted communication, which is the main precondition for you to be safe in the online environment, even though very often member states under the disguise of national security try to convince us otherwise. All of those are interconnected and there is no proper and adequate protection of freedom of speech without adequate data protection standards in place and a number of other safeguards. Um, there was a question posed by my uh, co-panelist why companies should actually comply with human rights. And I would argue that they do have a 
direct responsibility to protect, respect and remedy. Uh, and I believe that the United Nations and the human rights guiding principles of the UN would agree with me. And this is not only concerning the digital platforms and those very large online platforms as we call them in the EU, uh, but also other companies from other industries that have those responsibilities. And that's for obvious reasons, because they do have impact on public discourse and civic space, which is increasingly sh shrinking across the world. Um, there is a lot of chatter about so-called Digital Services Act of the European Union, one of the recently adopted flagship law that precisely is supposed to tackle the dissemination of illegal content, but not only. It tries to answer to those main issues and missing pieces in this space, such as empowerment of users, meaningful legally mandated transparencies on platform where they have to disclose data in order to make us understand how those systems, those content moderation and content recommender algorithms impact you as a user, your behavior, your choices, because the basic right of every user in this online ecosystem should be not to be manipulated by data abuse that is so much enshrined in uh, business models of big platforms. So um, maybe just to also respond to the last speaker, um, why we actually speak about DSA as a flagship law. And if we, if we turn the page and go back maybe five or six years, how member states used to respond to the spread of uh, hate speech or other forms of illegal content online, we saw a number of short-sighted solutions that ultimately have a very negative impact on your protection as individuals. We saw this overview of content removals under 24 hours, which is data taken from so-called code of conduct against illegal hate speech in the EU, which is, by the way, not that effective and questionable uh, self-regulatory measure uh, that was issued by the EU and those transparency criteria about platform conduct and how they tackle online hate speech are not exactly accurate or meaningful, that they would actually truly give you an overall picture of how platforms really respond to these societal phenomena. Um, and we also saw these restrictive measures, so swift, non-transparent removals of content, often based on terms of service or more restrictive measures in the national laws, um, inspire other more authoritarian regimes around the world, which has then far-reaching consequences, especially for human rights defenders, activists, LGBTQI plus communities, and other vulnerable groups. Um, this is probably not going to step just because the European Union is trying to turn the page and do the regulation better, but it's definitely the way forward how instead of tackling concrete categories of user-generated content that we don't like to see online, uh, rather focusing on those systems and processes these platforms deploy that influence you as a user and your behavior without your awareness and consciousness every day. Um, and can actually bring operations of these platforms under the public scrutiny and give us better understanding of how they actually take decisions and whether those decisions fully comply with the human rights protection that I will keep claiming they are actually bound by to comply with. Um, so to quickly conclude, um, we are, of course, just at the beginning and, and finding the right uh, way how to uh, truly establish those uh, regulatory responses, um, it's definitely multifaceted. We heard a lot from Cory Doctorov about the importance of competition and antitrust law and how to actually address that dominance of big platforms that also negatively impact the media landscape and the way how actually media nowadays operate. Um, but we have a good starting point and I hope that we can discuss this further later on during this panel. Thank you very much. <clears throat> So thanks to all of you for laying out your um, main positions on this question. I have a question for the audience now. Um, who is aware of the Digital Service Act and what it implies for our communication? Please raise your hand if you, if you are aware with the Digital Service Act. Okay. Um, maybe can I ask you to just outline what are the key points when it comes to regulation and freedom of speech in combination with the Digital Service Act that will be in charge, uh, I think, in 2024, um, February. Uh, 
Exactly, 17th of February 2024 is that magical date when the DSA should be fully enforced and applicable. So um, the Digital Services Act is this new flagship regulation that seeks to establish accountability of online platforms. Uh, it specifically singles out the big players that I don't have to introduce because I think we all do know who those very large online platforms, as DSA call them, are. But it also uh, establishes further obligations on um, how actually platforms operate, and that's an important aspect of the DSA. So it doesn't um, oblige platforms to respond to, for instance, certain category of user-generated content, like this is hate speech, you have to identify hate speech in this short timeline, and then you have to swiftly remo remove it, and if you don't, we're going to sanction you. But instead, it looks into how platforms moderate content that you post and share. And this is an important aspect in the DSA, it regulates uh, user-generated content that can be potentially illegal, and it looks into then the system, so content recommender systems, ad delivery techniques, content moderation algorithms, and whether those are transparent enough, well explainable to you as a user, so you actually understand what kind of rules really regulate your speech every day when you are using Facebook or other social media platforms. And it also empowers you uh, through, through different measures which are very novel in the DSA. And to mention a few, one is the ban on the use of sensitive categories of personal data in targeting. So how actually, uh, how you're being targeted by uh, online advertisement, what are the reasons behind it, how your data are being used in order to optimize those systems, and whether you as a user can in any way opt out from those policies. It also prevents platforms from using so-called dark patterns. So um, you all experienced maybe that one day you wanted to read the terms of service of a platform to understand what you actually agree upon or what you're going to consent to, and you found out that they are too long, they are not understandable, you're getting lost in there, and you have absolutely no idea what you actually agree upon once you go and use Meta. This is something DSA is trying to prevent by forcing platforms to develop proper interface design and keep their terms of service explainable in an easy format so you do understand what are actually your rights and obligations as a user on platform. And one final point, what DSA does very well, those are so-called due diligence obligations, especially if, you, if a platform is very large. And there, platforms will now have to assess the systemic risks that uh, their systems impose to uh, issues such as democracy, electoral integrity, basic fundamental rights from privacy to freedom of expression, and then they will have to adopt measures that will mitigate those risks, and they will also now have to subject themselves to so-called independent audits. So external players who will have a right to request certain data, they will have to get the access, and then they consequently will have a right to audit did those platforms and find out whether those systemic risks were properly identified and whether those mitigations that platform used is actually sufficient to mitigate those systemic risks. So that's a DSA in a nutshell. There is, not, there is much more to unpack, um, and I'm happy to answer any further questions you may have about this law. Thank you very much, Eliska, for this perfect roundup. Um, I have a question for all of you. Um, because now already by national law, the platforms are obliged to give a legal person contact. Um, and in Austria, most of the big platforms, um, they, they are willing to cooperate with the state and obey the law. And Facebook, Twitter, etc., they all already named the national contact person. Um, but Telegram did not, for example. And it was the same case in Germany as well, that they had to build up a high, really pressure from the government on Telegram because it's, um, it's by n so far it is impossible uh, to hand over a lawsuit, for example, to Telegram because there's no legal person. And they still just ignore the national law. And my question is because I, I did an investigation on that and I asked lawyers and everybody, so what are the consequences, theoretically? For example, if you post um, um, a plan how to build a bomb or how to kill the Prime Minister of Austria and you just keep circling this information and you cannot take it down from Telegram, for example. And what do you think? Should the state block the messenger service after a certain amount of time or just the, should they allow it to ignore the law? 
So who goes first? Who? I mean, I, I have a student writing a paper on Telegram, so I know a little bit about it through her, through her work. And I know it has a different ownership structure, right? It's owned by a single person. And, 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 and so, in a sense, it doesn't have... I'm, and as far as I know, it doesn't... It's, it's not really profitable, right? It's not gaining money. So the question of what is this technology? Is it a sort of business that falls under business law or is it a sort of technology that falls under sort of free use or something like that? Uh, a messenger service than, than a social media platform. Mm -hmm. um, but there was a special case uh, which made the question necessary because one doctor, she was threatened um, on the platform and the authority said they, they don't have a hand in it, so the, the, the death threats just kept on going. And that was the question I started to ask myself, like, if we have a national law that obliges um, a platform like this to have a legal contact and they just refuse to do it, what, what happens in the end? And what signal does it send to the others if, you, if it doesn't matter, if you obey the law or not? Yeah. I mean, I guess it gets to the question of enforcement, right? How can you actually enforce it? And, mm -hmm. and and, and this is, I think, a general dynamic, so I'll pivot off and let someone else come back to answer this tough question, but it, it, it goes to a general problem with this sort of technology where the technology and moving fast and breaking things is outpacing the, the, the speed of policy, outpacing the speed of research. We just can't keep up. And by the time this question gets settled, there'll be a new technology on the blockchain, you know, and Web3 that is going to require a whole new set of digital services acts to fill. So it, 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 I think it, the problem points to a bigger problem of this arms race between tech moving fast and institutions moving slow. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, um, okay, there are, there are a couple of things I would like to raise. So let's start from Telegram. Telegram, as such, it, it's a very hybrid uh, type of platform. On one hand, indeed, it can be used as a messaging app. Um, that does not, by the way, encrypt your communication by default. You actually have to, you know, adjust that in settings, which already, you know, impose a lot of question marks. Uh, but it also, to some extent, can function as a social media platform, given the huge amount of members in the Telegram groups that can actually be there and then disseminate the content. Um, we did, as Access Now, address a couple of letters to Mr. Duro. He doesn't respond to us either. Um, and I think with platforms of this type uh, in general, it's very interesting to see how they behave in different regions around the world. So if there is a uh, lots of regulatory pressure, and we usually see that in the countries in the global north or in the, let's say, Western countries, then the platforms are rather more scared to be held legally liable and tend to respond much faster to those regulatory demands and comply with the regulation. Mm -hmm. We saw a number of occasions in countries of global south where platforms are not subject to such a, a, a regulatory pressure, and then they tend to be much more negligent. And there are a number of examples from Myanmar to Ethiopia that we could mention. Um, and it was also interesting to see, especially in the case of illegal invasion of Ukraine, uh, how actually platforms were responding to the conflict situation and escalating of conflict much faster in contrast to other areas equally impacted by uh, armed conflict. <laughs> Um, so, what can be done, or if we just can, hypo, you know, have just think about some scenario uh, under the DSA? Um, of course, this is a non-compliance, and we would probably have to then analyze. Uh, terms of service of Telegram, uh, DSA also enables three different ways how to actually access effective remedy. One of them is out-of-court dispute settlement uh, that even has to be properly funded by these platforms. Um, and then it has sort of free-tiered approach where you as a user, if you are not satisfied with the decision of the platform, you can actually appeal. And then, at least in theory, you should always have access to the judicial independent by the court that, that will decide that case. There is, of course, fines for non-compliance, and in case if Telegram would qualify as a very large online platform, um, the European Commission has the enforcement power. How, the, how that enforcement will work, we need to wait until 2024, because it's a new model which has never been tried before. Um, but indeed, there are measures in place, we have to see whether they function, but Telegram is highly problematic, uh, pre precisely due to the lack of proper content governance policies. 
um, and then their lack of response in that responsiveness to any regulatory pressure. For a fact, the Austrian government had prepared a lawsuit against um, Telegram, and, and there's no one to give it to. <laughs> so we will see. What is your position about regulating social media platforms if they distribute dangerous content or fake content? I would like to add one more example, um, because I think it's fitting, and I hope I'm not proven wrong in a fact check. Um, I think it was, it was either this week or last week that a, a court in Germany, so we're going across the border from Austria to Germany, a court in Frankfurt decided that the section 130 of the criminal code in Germany that regulates incitement uh, is once you gather in a chat group, and one could argue that Telegram offers that possibility of chat groups that most of us might be primarily familiar with because of WhatsApp. So if people gather in a chat group, that section of incitement, that regulates incitement does not account, that is, cannot be held accountable against people gathering in a chat group, and in that case, law enforcement, um, I think, um, that exchange anti-Semitic racial slurs. So the decision was made, there's a verdict in now in, from Frankfurt, incitement, yes, we know of this, it's regulated in the criminal code, but if you do so in a closed chat group, there's nothing we can do. So uh, it means that the platform is not responsible for the content? Neither the platform nor the persons okay. can hold accountable that exchange those anti-Semitic okay. racial slurs. Interesting. Um, Michael, what do you think about this? That um, Who is responsible for the content and what could this possibly do to our political decisions? I think there's been a there's been an interesting sort of shift of responsibility away from users to the platform, right? Like if, if there's a piece of disinformation or hate speech uh, seen on TikTok or Twitter, it's TikTok or Twitter's problem. <laughs> where, where did their individual responsibility to the people who are spreading this go, right? Who are making this content? Uh, so I, I, I don't, to me, it's a very interesting question of why it's the platform's problem and not a problem of individual responsibility to begin with. Is it because we create? Um, that you have to um, get a grip on this person and if the platform is not giving you information about the account, you cannot reach to the individual person who put on that content. Mm -hmm. I agree. Um, I mean, and, and one question is, is why isn't there more identification that we have to sort of register with a platform? Um, but what makes the problem really complex, it, it's not just because people can be anonymous on the internet, it's because a lot of this content moves across platforms in a way that it starts in certain areas of the internet and then is strategically pushed out onto one platform and then taken and mixed to fit the architecture of another platform. So it's not just that you know, each platform has its own problems, but then there's also the ecosystem-wide problem. So things can start on Telegram and then get pushed into more mainstream platforms. And you'll never be able to see that jump from how it started here to how it got here. Mm -hmm. And you may assume it started here, but it actually started somewhere else. And it turns out it was a coordinated campaign to get this content out there. Well, it's the hashtag that becomes the trending topic and then becomes headline for the evening news, right? So how to, how to maneuver that? I guess you might have an idea how to. I definitely don't have any solid solutions to that yet, but there are definitely ideas. And one thing, so the idea of individual responsibility and why is it a platform? Well, one of the reasons why it should be a platform, on one hand, it's, a, of course, the way how we regulate the, the intermediary reliability. But even if we forget about that, platforms host that kind of content. And even if you as a user do not directly pay for the services that platform offer to you, there is this whole entire ad tech ecosystem in the background and how your data and how your content is being monetized in the process. 
Uh, platforms, of course, have a right to conduct the business, but they also have to ensure that the contractual obligation that they impose on their users are actually compliant with human rights and everything that we already discussed in that regard. Um, I do think, however, it is indeed the issue of ecosystem, so how that content is actually being distributed across the platform and how those mes messages are being specifically tailored to different custom audiences, including how your behavioral data are actually then being assessed by a platform and they specifically then deliver certain messages uh, to your newsfeed and promote certain content more than others. We have a number of studies that actually prove that. We have one specific study that our partner organization did called Algorithms of Trauma, where you can actually see how even the information that did, you did not consciously provide it uh, to a platform can be inferred about you precisely by those algorithms that actually operate in the background. And that's how that content then effectively spreads. And those who want to abuse this or are fully aware uh, uh, can then organize different, organize this information campaign. So it is very much boils down to what was also discussed by Corey, and that's uh, first of all the monopoly that these platforms hold, intentionally not making their services interoperable. So you as a user don't really have a chance to go anywhere else but stay on Meta, despite, or any other platform, despite the presence of the content that can be potentially harmful or illegal. You don't have a choice over those content recommender systems that push those hashtags and those contents because you don't really know what data they use to optimize it. And you don't have any proper opt-in or opt-out. And even if you did, the way how it's probably right now done on the interface design is done in a way that it would be too complicated for you as a user to actually go through that process. So you are stuck in something that many calls wall garden. Um, and that's precisely why we have to look for the solutions that actually tackle the root cause of this, and that's too much power in hands of very few platforms. Um, that, you know, at the end of the day, it is actually in their benefit to keep that dominance. And I just very quickly want to respond to one thing uh, when you mentioned Metaverse and Web 3.0. There are many tech bubbles that are extremely... Um, you know, intentionally made huge, and in reality, we don't even know whether this technology will eventually manifest into anything real. Um, and one of my favorite exercises that we do also at Access Now, and my colleagues who work on the emerging tech often do that, is debunking the myth around AI and machine learning system and chat GPT and a number of other technologies that are always being introduced, like this big boom who is going to revolutionize the tech industry. In reality, they're not going to do that. And those issues that they impose for your rights as users, we already named them. We do know how discriminatory bias is present in them, and we do know at least the basic measures that we can put in place to mitigate those. So if someone will tell you that they are metaverse experts, do not trust them. There is no such thing. Okay. Um, Michael, um, can you give us an overview of your current knowledge, if this is your field of expertise, how important is social media for political processes and decisions now and maybe in the future? I mean, there's one question of, of how do these platforms affect political processes, right? What does it mean that people can discuss things on social media? Well, how does that affect their interest in politics, their knowledge, something like that? But I think, the way that, that I approach this and how I think a lot of researchers approach this is we, we can actually learn about modern political processes by studying the platforms. So if you think about how political research has been done for decades, you ask people a survey question, right? What do you think about this? How likely are you to vote? And when someone's asked a question, they're primed to respond in a certain way. Right? If you ask someone, are you a racist? They're probably going to say no, because they know they're being studied. But they may have racist views. When we look at social media, we can sort of lift from these conversations how people are discussing organically. They're not being primed. They're just operating in their everyday life. And we can study those environments. Of course, the data we get from these platforms is very bad. So we only get a very small slice of what's actually happening. But um, so it, it's a bit of a different question from studying the effect. I mean, I think of social media for, for politics and, and the voters. OK, I'll give you a, a short answer in that for many years, 
researchers considered the health of a democracy by how many people vote. And you would just measure voting, right? There's been more of a turn in the past 20 years towards looking at what happens before voting, and that's conversation. And so conversation really is the soul of democracy, and there's a lot of research going into political talk as being the most important thing. And so social media changes how we talk about politics and democracy and television and everything else, right? It's, it's, it's a mix of everything. And what is interesting, I think, and we don't have the answer to, is how do processes like what's being talked about change because of social media? There's much more input from citizens in terms of things like the Me Too movement or Black Lives Matter that can come into the public agenda because of social media. But then also, I think it's interesting to think about what does it mean that our conversations are changing from discussions at the dinner table or out at the bar to TikTok videos or to retweeting things? Like, actually, it's not words. Right? There's all these weird multimedia stories and, and, and things, checking into places, putting, uh, changing your face to look like a dog as you're going to vote, you know, with one of these Snapchat filters. What does that mean actually for the quality of our political discourse? I don't know. It, th th there's two thoughts. One is that it simplifies things too much and we don't discuss serious issues. So that's bad for democracy. On the upside, these sorts of silly ways and TikTok videos, are able to get people interested in politics who may not have been before. Things like influencers, sort of talking about, if you follow the influencer channel for one thing, but when it turns to an election, they say, go out and vote. Don't care who you vote for, just do it. That gets people interested and starts them on the process of becoming better citizens. So the quality of discourse is lower, but the interest, especially among youth, can be higher. And so that's really the trade-off, I think. Mm -hmm. um, when it comes to the potential threat of being manipulated um, on purpose by a political campaign, by groups. There was now an investigation that was released uh, a few days ago from a worldwide collaboration of, of journalists about a group in Israel that allegedly was influencing um, regional and national conflicts and, and votings and elections. Um, maybe you, can you give us an insight about where are the threats of manipulating political processes via digital rooms? Well, not on, on Storytellers, mm -hmm. that's the, the investigation or the, the huge title of uh, that huge work that colleagues did, um, led by Forbidden Stories, a, um, a, how do you say, a team that was um, initially founded to continue the work of Daphne Gorana Galizia, the, the Maltese journalist which got killed, who got killed. Um, it's, it's a trove of information that they um, continue to work on, um, mainly focusing what they call disinformation and fake news. One, one uh, specific investigation is that on Team Jorge, I think, I don't speak Spanish. Um, so, yeah, there you go, thank you. Um, so, and, and allegedly, those men, three men, um, Israelis, um, some kind of two of them at least claim to be affiliated or were affiliated um, with the Israeli armed forces, intelligence services. They claimed um, we can do anything you want in terms of manipulation of election results with an expensive price tag in the millions, of course. Um, what it seems at least from what I've read and what I've seen on TV, um, that's a privately held company. Um, very similarly, is an investigation I referred to in the very beginning is that of Ghostwriter, um, where German intelligence services, at least in an interview with us, um, one head of the German intelligence services made clear, he clearly attributed that threat actor to Russia. Um, and he made the conclusion um, that this group, presumably it's a group, not a single person, threat actor sort of on doing the job in, in, in for Russia is about to manipulate the German Bundestag elections. But asking for evidence, and I mean, this is what I do, obviously I observe, <coughs> I ask questions, but I also need to verify the answers and there is no evidence that was shared with us, 
right? Mm -hmm. So how to prove or disprove, how to verify, how to falsify, this is where we got stuck in the investigation. Mm -hmm. And I think eventually that, that team that worked on the Team Roche investigation at some point got stuck too. Mm -hmm. um, so there was advertisement, there were talks, there was a hidden camera that they used, taping those um, adversary talks with Team Roche with no eventually clear evidence what they had well, from their point of view, succeeded to been doing in terms of manipulating elections. So we simply do not know. Mm -hmm. We're stuck. Eliska, do you know a little bit more about how, how they might have been working or how information has been used to influence um, political point of views? So, um, interestingly enough, uh, these European College, so the current European Commission and European Parliament are on this regulatory spree when they adopted a number of different regulations and they are also working on the political ads regulation, which is precisely, it seeks to prevent similar manipulations. And this is nothing new. We all remember Cambridge Analytica. Um, and uh, in, in this particular Israeli case, those were a mixture of different disinformation campaigns from foreign, foreign agent disinformation campaign with other, other types, which are usually, especially when they are mixed together and they're targeted, they are usually the most effective. Also, I think some of those elections, they claim that they influence, it could have never been verified and there are question marks whether they were indeed as successful. Um, but I think it again comes down to uh, pretty much the, the bottom line and that's the way how the data are being used. And one of the things that we are asking in order to actually prevent uh, manipulations, and by the way, your freedom to form an opinion, even under international human rights legally binding standard, is absolute. So no one has a right to interfere with your right of, or your freedom of thought and freedom to form an opinion. Um, and that's precisely what happens when there are these sort of hidden forces manipulating and making you maybe arrive to decision where we cannot really tell whether you would arrive to those decisions under different circumstances. And so what we are asking for is to incorporate a specific ban on the use of so-called inferred and observed data. So data that these different algorithms and automated decision-making processes happening in the background infer from your behavior and that you as a user have a, no chance to control because those processes are so complex that not even transparency or actually no meaningful transparency can be properly established when it comes to these so-called ad delivery techniques. We also pushed very strictly for two separate definitions of targeting and ad delivery technique because they are not exactly the same thing. Over targeting, you can perhaps gain some level of control over ad delivery technique hardly ever. And indeed, there are simply abuse of data and practices that even the best regulation and the level of transparency cannot tackle. And if that's the case, they just should not be allowed. And summarizing that, and maybe that is a sort of satisfying result or answer, at least it come, it's clear, I, I think, I strongly believe it's clear, that there is a market, apparently. Right. You mean a market for disinformation campaigning and getting paid for it? For companies, um, but also threat actors, state actors, non-state actors, semi-state actors, whatever category you'd like to choose and label it with, there is a market. Michael. Can I just jump in and, and maybe just, just uh, dispel, like, put you at ease a bit that uh, the, the, the research shows that, that people who see a political ad that's fake or trying to persuade them, they don't automatically believe this, right? That, that it's too simple. And that's not to say that, that any of the panelists are wrong or anything. It's, it's just to say that it's not that bad. And if you think about it, I mean, this, this theory has been disproven before where there used to be an idea of the magic bullet theory or the hypodermic needle theory that people believe all the propaganda they see. It doesn't work that way. Where it does seem to have a more persuasive effect, if you see fake information, is like in the comment fields because of the source of the person. If, if, if you see someone responding in a comment agreeing with fake information, and that person seems to be like you, politically or ethnically or racially, you're more likely to believe that information. It's not from the top-down targeting. There are problems definitely with how that data is delivering things to people but that rarely is going to have a persuasive effect. Because think about the environment that people are seeing these ads. 
on their phone with the sound off as they're waiting for the bus. But if they see controversial information that focuses attention, and if they think that, oh, this commenter who looks like me and thinks like me is agreeing with this information, then you tap into the social identity dynamics that are persuasive. So it's called astroturfing, where you're having a sort of fake comment feed, and that's where these sort of Russian trolls come in. It's not in the top-down messaging, it's more in the, oh, my group thinks this way, I should think this way as well. What do you think about the quality of discourse and um, debating in the digital era? on political views? Mm -hmm. I think that it's hijacked by a vocal minority. So one thing we can say from social media research is that over and over and over, a very small number of people who have very extreme views make up the majority of our data sets. <laughs> it's always concentrated among a small number of users, and these tend to have the most extreme opinions. So the problem is, if you looked at a general election hashtag, if you just search for the conversation around an election, the chances that you would be seeing the perspectives of people who are extreme and highly active is very high. It's not the majority of what people think and it's not the majority of conversation. So there is a, and research also tends to show this, that people think other, everyone thinks everyone is more polarized than they actually are. People are more moderate in their political opinions than you generally think, they just stay silent in online conversation. So the problem is you have an overrepresentation over of extreme views. And so if you just looked at the conversation on social media, you'd say, wow, people are violent racists, but that's not the majority of the world, right? So don't lose the, what you think in your, or what you see in your offline world is more representative of what you see online. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Silke, because we also talked about um, regulation that might be necessary when you look at disinformation campaigns, but what would regulation do to whistleblowers, for example? Well, first and foremost, I would wish that the European Union at some point, um, and that means subsequently Switzerland, where I work, <laughs> this is my juristical, that is my jurisdiction as a reporter where I can be held liable, um, that they, that they're, that politicians, legislation might come to a conclusion eventually how to protect whistleblowers. And there are, in Switzerland, I think, think since 15 years, Switzerland tries to somehow put together a law that protects people who'd like to speak up against misconduct, corruption, sexualized violence um, in the working environment, but also in their and their hobby associations, I don't know, their, their music band, um, to speak up and somehow can be sure that they are sort of legally protected. And I think on European level, um, there have been such ideas and workings around it too, but somehow it is apparently quite difficult to put it into written, signed off, and make it a law, right? Um, so th that is the protection of the, my sources, eventually. People that I rely on. Um, I do ref try not to use the word whistleblower, because most of the people that I worked with that I would identify as a whistleblower who had been identified and labeled, again, it's about labeling, media is strong at labeling, um, whether it's reality winner or Chelsea Manning, um, Yasmin Motayemi, who, uh, who eventually um, aired her concerns about um, misconduct at Nestle. Um, Nestle does have uh, social responsibility. Um, they do not agree with that term, and thus I try not to use it. Nevertheless, it is called the whistleblower directive, it is called whistleblower law, and we call for whistleblower protection. Other way around is, what can I do as a reporter to protect my sources? Um, especially in the digital field, there are countless um, resources, guidelines out there, reporters with our borders, um, the Committee for Protecting Journalists, your unions, hopefully, could provide you assistance and digital 
security, um, avoiding surveillance, whether by state actors, non-state actors, um, avoidance to be doxxed or hacked. Um, so that is sort of, those are the organizations that I turn to uh, when I need protection as well. And again, because we heard it on stage before, um, my appeal, what you can do is to prepare yourself is to unionize uh, and, and let, you, let uh, your union help you, especially when it comes to a legal battle. Usually they provide um, assistance, financial assistance, um, to get a lawyer on board to defend you in a legal case eventually. Thank you. Um, Eliska, I would like to ask you and then open up to questions and answers. Um, how do you combine the need for regulation with people's right to freedom of expression? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and we also have to face the reality that the protection of freedom of expression always goes hand in hand with the state of the rule of law in that particular country or in that particular region. And there are parts of the world where you cannot rely on state that they're going to regulate in a manner that your free speech is or will be protected because it's the state who is the main perpetrator of violence and human rights violations, who actually prosecute journalists, uh, human rights activists. So that's one kind of starting point because regulation, and especially when we discuss freedom of expression, can be widely abused. And even the most well-intended legal measures can be actually abused if they end up in wrong hands. And the European Union has the advantage that at least in most of member states, we still have the functioning rule of law and we have independent judicial authorities. Um, but I do think that the regulation can be designed in a way that it keeps human rights and users' empowerment in its center. I'm not going to say that European Union got it all right, and I by no means represent European Union or European Commission here, but I do think that it does offer some solid starting point that has to be tested. Um, and it also depends on you individual users and communities to keep asking for better protections of your rights and to understand how platforms actually treat your rights um, and what happens to your content on an everyday basis. Um, so I think that balance now, at least the sort of a model we have in place and we have to see. Um, as for other parts of the world, even the regulatory framework as the DSA uh, if it's going to be copy-pasted in other jurisdictions around the world, and we already see that happening, or it's going to be used as an excuse to adopt more restrictive measures, as we saw, as we saw in Turkey, um, there is, of course, potential for the abuse, and it will probably keep happening. Um, so um, that would be one thing, and maybe one more thing that I would like to add on regulation, because we often hear... When you regulate platforms, they're actually going to, you know, either their resources are going to suffer or you're going to place obstacle to this mythical unicorn called innovation, uh, which is often throws out there. No one really knows what it means in practice and why me seeking my rights to be protected, I am blocking innovation from happening. Um, but especially, it's a good approach to regulation because Indeed, that danger might exist, especially for smaller platforms of a smaller scale that may, might struggle if you create too much of a regulatory burden on them. But one thing, again, DSA does is that it actually provides different set of obligations that are calibrated differently depending on the size and the influence of the actor in question. We have to see whether that will work in practice, but at least in theory, that might be the way how to go about it. Um, so maybe for those who are interested in regulation and the way how your rights are being protected, question your political representatives, um, keep asking questions from platforms, uh, do push for more transparency, raise the awareness, because uh, without that it doesn't matter what the legislator does if, if we just go uh, passively about it every day. And get on Mastodon. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. I want to add one more question when it comes to Mastodon, because in our preliminary talk, you, you said that, that you might represent a very provocative point of view when it comes to Twitter and Elon Musk. So I wanted to ask you, what do you think about this new approach of Twitter to, to grant re-access to those accounts who have been banned because of hate speech or whatever, to have everyone 
being able again to be on Twitter. Is this a good thing or is it a bad thing? Yeah, okay, so the controversial position is that when you buy something, you can do whatever you want with it. I mean, this is a, a, a fundamental sort of right of, of owners in, in the, the system that we have now, right? You can argue if that system is good or bad. Um, there is also a, but it, it's not just that simple. So let's say Elon Musk opens up the, the gates and says all banned users can come back and, and any speech is allowed, uh, then people will leave the platform, right? They will self-select out. So it's not in his interest to do that. Um, but it's just a, uh, the, 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 the question is to think, like, when you own, when you're running a business, who's to tell you how to run that business? And you can respond to public pressure or you can choose not to, but if you own it and take it private, then it's your business. So it's more a business point of view that he, as a businessman, um, can do with the product whatever he wants. That, yes. Is that what you say? Yes. Or yeah. what is the counter argument to that? Okay. Thank you very much for all of you now. Um, oh, I would like to invite you um, for a question, answer, statements, ideas, counter ideas on this matter. What are the chances um, of digital area and political processes that are laying ahead of us? Anyone who wants to share with us and jump into the discussion. Yes, please. Can somebody please pass on a microphone? Um, I, would just, uh, I wanted to say something to the argument that whoever owns something can do with it whatever he or she wants. Because, for example, in the German constitution, there is that property also comes with responsibility. And if you own something that important for society, I think it's not just that you own it and you can do whatever you want. May I just, may I just add, um, <coughs> maybe a bit more specific, um, I think what got lost in parts of the, the argument or dis disputes or discourse when it comes to freedom of speech is People that argue for the freedom of speech, expression, of, of, of opinion, they lose, they, some of them lost sight that it brings consequences. It's not free of consequences, right? And that is something that we think should keep reminding us with rights come obligations and responsibilities. When we then talk about the big platforms who, um, yeah, dominate our conversations uh, in the digital space, who would then have the responsibility for the content that is posted on it? Wow. You, you mentioned the whole supply chain, so to yeah. speak, and I agree with that. So, sorry? It, you, I, I would describe it sort of a supply chain, um, starting with the user. I hate that word, right? I don't want to be a user, but mm -hmm. yeah. Um, that person that posts mm -hmm. on a platform, whether it's Mastodon or Twitter, does not matter, it starts with that person. Mm -hmm. It is my responsibility what I air, what I distribute. I think we also have to say goodbye to this um, idea of that it's only individuals posting on platforms. No, it starts. I don't say it stops there. That's why mm. I but agree uh, yeah. with you. It's sort of a supply chain. But I think it's also development that we are now facing, um, mm. um, that it will be more about organizations and bots and um, artificial intelligence that is um, distributing information, not individuals to that extent. Of course, it's the majority still, but that is also um, something that is behind political campaigning, that it's, it's not an individual itself. So mm. who is then responsible for taking down content that might be harmful to minorities or even Mm. Um, you know, um, start a conflict in the region or whatever. I, I do think that uh, it cannot be just about the individual responsibility, even though I definitely agree that there has to be obviously outreach and education and everything in the process. But if a platform on one hand, and obviously we do know that that is, that is happening, amplify certain content, and because they run the business, 
there are certain terms of service and given also the, the waste amount of user generated content that is being posted on those platforms, um, of course, they have to exercise some content moderation, and it's also in platforms' interest because, you know, if we face the reality, none of us like to be on platform where hate speech spreads without any control. Um, and now, even if we keep the regulation out of that, uh, you know, platforms are private actors. They're mainly interested in gaining the profit, and if you leave the platform, that means less money, right? So, so these terms of service you know, are in place for, for good reasons, then we can discuss how good they are and how well they regulate the conduct and the user-generated content that is being shared there. So, but I think that it's a, you know, it's a shared responsibility after all. States have clear obligation to protect our human rights, including, you know, so-called positive obligation against interferences by private actors, including platforms, and they have to regulate in a manner that supports your rights and doesn't violate them further. Platforms have the responsibility to also respond to the spread of illegal content or potentially harmful or you name it, uh, user-generated content. And they have to make sure that the policies that they have in place are, again, robust enough to capture that. And they do rely on automated decision-making processes because there is no other way how to do this. Because especially in the case of very large players, um, they have to moderate a huge amount of the content. But I would like to think about it differently as well, because these are indeed systemic issues, so we're not going to give the answer here who should be responsible. But imagine the world for a moment where you actually have more localized, more community-driven, smaller platforms, or maybe you want to stay on Meta, but you want to understand how your content is being curated. And imagine the world that there could be third-party players who could come to Meta and offer their content recommender systems for you with the more transparent measures, with the standards that you actually understand and that truly somehow reflect your value as a community or as an individual. So there is a difference whether you are on Mastodon or you are on Meta. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a matter of choice and it's a matter of control that you have as a user. And that's one way how we can go about it, and we have to do it also through competition law because there is no other way. I think we have a question over there. Yes, please. Okay. Um, I have a question because you just said it's a matter of choice. I also think it's a matter of accessibility to the platforms. And this is something that's so important. And when you mentioned the abbreviation DSA, I thought, well, I've heard this abbreviation before, but I didn't know where. And I'm an activist in the movement of people with handicaps. And people try very hard to get access, but they manage to tackle Facebook. And then Twitter or other platforms are really tough. It's really tough. And during um, the corona era, I tend to say a lot of people left this digital space, feminists, activists with leftist attitudes, human rights activists, who are not well-known prominent persons because they couldn't stand the attacks mm -hmm. they had to endure. And this is something, this, this topic of accessibility has to do with social justice and also the represent to, to have in this digital ecosystem, more or less a fair representation of people, how, live, how we live with different abilities, disabilities, colors, political ideas. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, can I ask you a question as well? Because that was a very interesting um, insight. Do you think um, these people that you refer to that left platforms, should they be protected within the platforms or from the platforms? Um, Okay, I have to stand up, thank you. <laughs> um, I think um, platforms should protect them, but this is something that we try to do, that we support each other, so that we knew some of our activists said, well, um, I'm, uh, I get a shit storm on this platform, and not many, but maybe 10 or 20 of us try to organize to support the person and to do counter speech. Mm -hmm. And to do counter speech means you have to be, um, you have to 
react very fast, you have to react in the night, you have to, you try to be funny, mm -hmm. that you're not a badass <coughs> feminist, for example, mm -hmm. also I love to be this sometimes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. uh, and it's, uh, counter speech is really a tough job. Mm -hmm. I think you have to combine both do you see an effect um, when you say that you, you kind of work together and then try to help a colleague of yours? Do you see that it has an effect, the work that you do? Um, we all get... Um, we, we, we are forced to gain <laughs> knowledge if we want or not. Mm -hmm. And um, we learn how to um, organize and to train counter speech in a very often masculinist, toxic society. <laughs> and you can learn a lot also when you organize in the real life. So online and offline effects, this is something I find very interesting. Very much. Who else wants to join the discussion? Please feel free. Um, I feel like two or three years ago, I heard a lot of more discourse about breaking apart big platforms. And I don't maybe just my friendship circle changed a bit and I hear different opinions now. But I have the impression that like lately we've gone a bit away from this and we're now more with the, okay, leave them be, these like huge uh, conglomerates and just make it more transparent. Is, is that, does that meet reality or are there still like, um, discourses that are like, this has to be split apart and it's the easy solution. Maybe you want to answer? And that's a great question and it, it, little <laughs> little, it, it goes back a little to the whole question of Musk uh, buying a Twitter. Um, because to some extent we should probably also ask the question, how is it possible that one billionaire is able to come and buy a platform that has been called by the US Supreme Court a modern town square, where for many in different parts of the world, it's, it was the main platform where to express their political views or even participating in public discourse. Now, when you belong to minorities, you might have different opinions because Twitter didn't always get it right. But it was a platform that was very accessible to us as civil societies. It had human rights team, it had a number of other uh, committees or they were seeking direct feedback from us in contrast to many other platforms who don't do that to this day. Um, but I would say that that discourse definitely did not disappear, and I will again give example of the EU because it's the one that I know the best. Um, so indeed you have the Digital Services Act that precisely takes the road of transparency, uh, but not only it goes beyond, but it, it has a specific set of measures oriented on indiv individuals. Uh, but we also have a sister regulation to it called Digital Market Act, and it was already briefly mentioned by Corey, which precisely tackles that uh, dominance, the market dominance of so-called online gatekeepers, which are very large online platforms in other, other term, more competition law-like term. And that law will maybe, hopefully, ultimately prevent a next meta uh, from you know, occurring and hopefully it will provide those safeguards that for a long time were missing and we pretty much did not probably reform our competition and antitrust laws on time in order to you know, realize that what kind of monsters are actually growing here and how much power and economic dominance they are able to gather. So I wouldn't say that it disappeared, quite the opposite. I think these are complementary approaches that actually have to go hand in hand together in order to have some you know, uh, not necessarily bulletproof, but meaningful regulation in the future. And data protection standards is, of course, another one. So we really need to get under control how we enforce GDPR because we're not exactly great at that. Um, but it is still there, live and kicking, and we have to wait for the following decade whether it can deliver. I might be backing up uh, Michael's position here, but um, I just thought, you know, this was the case with legacy media a long time before, that it could be acquisitioned by one person or by one company. So um, it had been the case before with, with traditional newspapers or TV stations that had power 50 years ago. Um, so you can also see it from that perspective that it's, it's just the same thing, just with a new form of technology. 
large extent it definitely is and the mergers uh, and the state advertisement of media and and how state actually uh, their control over media and their editorial independence that's all still prevailing issue inside of the EU as well without naming any concrete countries it is still extremely problematic where we know that we have almost no independent media left Again, there is another regulation <laughs> coming from the EU that is trying to answer to that, and we will see. We are only at the beginning of negotiation process. But absolutely, to that extent, it might be a similar issue, but obviously the scale of it is, of course, much larger if you have a platform that operates globally and is dominant you know, across the world and huge markets. Yes, please. If I can just... Um if I can just add, I think one of the, the interesting things, I mean, I think, I think Corey laid out very well where it's problematic when these companies are every part of the chain, right? The buyers and the suppliers and all those crazy economic terms. Um, but to, to get to your point, I think one thing that's, that's quite interesting is, is five years ago when they had these hearings in the United States Senate with uh, uh, Zuckerberg going to testify before Congress, and I think we all remember um, those pictures and all the media coverage. I mean, one of the things he said was that, no, we're not a monopoly because we can have a company that can come up and displace us like that. And everyone thought he was crazy, and I'm not backing up Mark Zuckerberg, but TikTok happened in like two years and essentially became, it is now the main competitor to Facebook out of nowhere. And I didn't believe him when I heard that either. Like, there's no way there's going to be able to challenge this monopoly, duopoly. But it, he, he was right in a sense. TikTok came out of nowhere and rivals that platform in terms of time spent, people creating content, engagement. Um, that is interesting that you mentioned TikTok because yesterday um, there was a panel here that was about the Global South and Global North and unlikely alliances between those two. And we had a panelist um, born in Iran and she lives in Berlin. And she mentioned TikTok... As, as the example for manipulating the global youth um, from their political behavior, more or less. What do you think about TikTok um, and political behavior and the influence it has on, on young people? Because she had a conspiracy that it is really um, from the Chinese government brought into the world um, to influence the Western youth. I've heard this conspiracy, and I don't know if it's true, so I, I don't even know if I call it a conspiracy, but there is a belief out there, and you can verify this yourself. I don't know. I just saw a video online. You know, a terrible uh, example here. But someone was arguing that this is exactly the thing, that TikTok, if you go and if you access it from China, it's actually promoting things like doing good in school, <laughs> like things that we tend to value as positive, and then... If you look at anything it's promoted outside of China, it's these like ridiculous videos that, that are just a waste of time, essentially. Or you learn about how you could cut a lettuce faster, you know, like things that are not really so important. So that may be the case, but it, it, it is worth looking into, is that if it comes out, TikTok is this huge sort of uh, psyop information warfare to corrode uh, Western generations. Well, smart move, I guess, by the Chinese. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. There is one more question. We have five more minutes, so... Um... I'll wrap up fast. So, uh, my question concerns the, uh, yeah, sorry. the regulation of misinformation within the Digital Act. So, I mean, someone can say that this information clearly might fall outside the robustness of the protections that we are guaranteed by the Free Speech Act. But misinformation can be a gray zone in many cases, especially because you might misinform someone without intention to manipulate or you might provide misleading information. And most of the people who oppose regulation in many regards are afraid that that might be certain, that might impose certain constraints on the freedom of speech that they have. So can you specify maybe what kind of measures regarding the regulation of misinformation in particular are prescribed in the act? You very well described the difference between misinformation and disinformation. Disinformation carries intent, uh, misinformation doesn't. Um, but both of them can be occasionally, even if it's just purely misinformed uh, behavior, it can be a vehicle for, for instance, hate speech against certain targeted communities. And we saw a lot of that type of content precisely during COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so, indeed, in the EU law context, these two categories of content are not considered to be illegal, right? So, they are not governed by the criminal law and for very, very good reasons, they should never be governed by criminal law. And so then, you're very much left with 
on one hand something that the law cannot do, and this is the least popular <laughs> answer to, to this question. And I myself, I'm very cautious when it comes to recommending digital literacy because we need to also understand who we target with digital literacy and how effective it is. And it should not be you know, promoted as this panacea to all issues because it certainly isn't, but it does play an important role. Then it's also the question of, for instance, promoting the content of public interest, especially in times of emergencies and crisis. And again, that brings its own difficulties. Who determines what is the content of public interest or who are those independent sources or independent media in countries? So again, you should have some proper oversight and it shouldn't be very large online platforms deciding who those actors are. Uh, but it is one element that is currently being explored uh, how to actually promote such content more in order to debunk certain types of misinformation. And then the, the third measure, which is within the DSA, and again, not that popular answer, transparency is not a silver bullet, but it can at least give us more information about you know, how misinformation spread and how it interacts with uh, different ad delivery techniques or monetization, for instance, or click bite and so on. Um, and then, of course, if there is a systemic risk stemming from such content, then we can actually tackle it through due diligence, which in my view can be the most effective way how to respond to these potentially harmful, potentially legal but harmful content, um, where, you know, the platform will self-assess first their measures, how they respond to it, what kind of impact it has. And then we, of course, have also the different code of conduct now. Uh, one is purely dedicated to disinformation, which is much more powerful now under the DSA. The first evaluation of the code came out, I think, one month ago, and the results are pretty awful um, because they are very inconclusive. But I think that these type of more due diligence oriented measures can then mitigate the potentially negative impact even of misinformation or disinfo in the future. So, but it is a definitely a, a incredible challenge, and I don't think that we have, you know, any bulletproof solutions to that. Thank you very much. We have one more question that we can take in, please. There was a lady. Can you give her the microphone? Yeah, it's a very short question. I just want to ask uh, at the end, uh, who protects us against the legal disinformation? Uh, that, uh, for example, comes from our public uh, medias that we have to pay for, even. So Can I ask, what do you mean by... About, maybe I uh, don't... Mean but what do you mean I with legal disinformation? Yeah, well, our, our medias, our, our governmental medias, and so on. I mean, uh, uh -huh. we know we are not little children anymore, that we know that <laughs> it's not all the truth that comes up to, uh, mm -hmm. down to us from up there, mm -hmm. uh -huh. isn't it? <laughs> I don't know, it's just maybe a rhetoric question just to think about. I have, I have maybe an example that can help back this up. I mean, one of the, and of course, a pandemic is a, is a problematic time period because there's a lot of information you don't know. And as we learn more, things change, right? Well, if you remember this idea that, that COVID came from a lab was labeled as a conspiracy theory. And then the US, what a, I forget what agency comes out and says, evidence suggests COVID came from a lab leak two years later, right? As the information is corrected. And so there is no liability in place for, for media who, who were talking and saying that was a conspiracy theory two years ago. And that serves to lower trust in people who are spreading that online. And so you're right, there is no accountability for, for, for exactly, as you were saying, the misinformation problem. That wasn't necessarily disinformation. It wasn't malicious. It wasn't trying to persuade people one thing. It was being misinformed. Thank you. If I also may answer, I think um, the answer lies in media literacy, to be able to look into different sources to question facts and figures, to check um, what the information, to have different media, alternative media. Um, you know, you're not forced like in, in other authority, uh, um, states to just have this main uh, information media source. So I think it's really about media literacy to be able to um, identify information, question information, have different sources and be able to then um, analyze what you're reading and what you're fed. I, yeah, please. 
So I think that state sponsored this information that we also saw during COVID-19, or we actually see it, especially in countries that are more leaning towards the democratic backsliding. Even in the EU, we, we see that it is indeed happening and it's extremely challenging, especially, and it comes again back to who holds the control over media and what are those editorial standards that you know then regulate independence of media and also who qualifies as a media service provider who has those objective information. Um, and I think it is really difficult to tackle that through regulations that would be directly responding to state-sponsored disinformation or whatever you call it, or state propaganda to some extent. Um, because again, it goes deeper to the issues around the rule of law as well, how much we can actually safeguard or prevent state interferences with the independence of media. And I think the EU went through and still goes through significant rule of law crisis where we proved to be quite powerless when it comes to um, you know, supporting media actors or independent media reporting in those you know, troublemakers in the EU. So, but it doesn't only concern those countries. We actually, I think, and there are better people positioned on this panel to talk about it, but I think we see that across the whole EU. So, um, yeah, not exactly a clear answer to your question, unfortunately, because I'm afraid I don't have one. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. So, um, thank you, Silke. Thank you, uh, Elishka, and thank you, Michael, um, for the discussion. Thank you also for um, getting into the discussion. And I wish you a very good Elevate Festival for today and tomorrow. And it lasts until Sunday. And, and also enjoy the dancing part. And thank you very much. <laughs> Have fun. Thank you. Thank you.